Well, as you know, this is the fifth in our series of UCLA Open Forums, or town meetings, where we've tried to present the various aspects of university life to the members of the Alumni Association. We've met with the students, we've met with the regents, we've met with the Academic Senate, we've met with the Chancellor of the University, and tonight we're really very fortunate in having an opportunity to meet with the President of the University of California. Charles J. Hitch earned his Bachelor of Arts with highest distinction at the University of Arizona. Following a year at Harvard, he became a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. At the time of his final oral, oral examination, he was accorded a rare honor. Instead of questioning him, the examining dons rose when he entered the room and tipped their hats. He was elected a fellow of Queens College and became the first American Rhodes Scholar to be made an Oxford Don. In 1941, he joined the first U.S. Land Lease Mission in London under Averill Harriman. From there, he moved on to the War Production Board in Washington, D.C. In 1948, he joined the Rand Corporation and later became head of its research council. In 1959, he accepted the invitation of President Kennedy to become Assistant Secretary of, De of Defense and in 1965 he came to the University of California at the invitation of Clark Kerr as Vice President for Business and Finance. On May 23, 1968, in ceremonies at UCLA, Charles Hitch became the 13th President of the University. Tonight I think we're particularly fortunate to have the President of the University here to discuss some of the problems that we have in higher education. You're all aware, I think, of the budget crisis that currently faces higher education in this state. And I'm not sure that we all have any of the answers or that any of us have the answers. But at least this evening will give us an opportunity to discuss the problems with the gentleman who has the greatest opportunity to know those potential answers. It does give me a great deal of pleasure to introduce the president of our University of California, Mr. Charles J. Hitch. Regent Bill Ferrer, students, staff, faculty, friends, and alumni in this great campus. 13 is my lucky number. I am truly delighted to be here this evening, for this must be a nearly ideal audience, a large group representing all ages, occupations, interests, and opinions but with a common tie, UCLA, and hopefully with a common predilection to receive the university president, at least with sympathy. I can assure you that I am not as sanguine about all my speaking engagements. Once upon a time, of course, a university president could speak before any audience anywhere and be assured of receiving the accolades due his lofty and respected position. Times, however, have changed, and presidents these days are beset by demons of all shapes and sizes. I would like to read you a fantasy, at least I hope it's a fantasy, which I came across recently. What would happen if a group of student or non-student guerrillas kidnapped the president of a large university and held him for ransom? James M. Shea, the vice president at Temple University, suggests that it might evoke the following letter addressed to the East Coast Conspiracy to Kidnap University Presidents from the trustees of typical university. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your note of January 25th. 
in which you request funding in the amount of $100,000 by tomorrow evening to ensure against the permanent absence from the campus of Dr. Rowland, the university president. The vital questions raised in your communication have been discussed fully by the president's cabinet. The executive committee of the board of trustees as well as the Ransom Committee of the Faculty Senate. <laughs> as you know, all requests for funds must go first to the Finance Committee of the Board, <laughs> and then to the full board, which meets next on April the 28th. <laughs> If you and your co-conspirators have had an opportunity to read the Carnegie Commission report on financing higher education, you will know that most schools and colleges are experiencing fiscal difficulty. Our university is no exception. For your information, a copy of this valuable report is enclosed. <laughs> Despite the long hours and hard work by the trustees and administration to cut costs, the university still faces a sizable deficit this fiscal year. Because of recent fiscal reverses, the board feels its responsibility to balance the budget far exceeds the real and sometimes sentimental attachment it has for employees. <laughs> Dr. Rowland has been president for 10 years and is now two years from retirement. During his tenure, he has given the university thoughtful and able leadership. The various university constituencies have regretfully, here regretfully feel that in light of the university's present fiscal crisis, we cannot fund your group in the amount requested. For the record, however, the Executive Committee and the Board of Trustees does want Dr. Rowland to know that it unanimously approved a motion to continue the university's contribution to his Blue Cross and major medical plans. <laughs> if the fiscal picture should improve in the near future, you have our assurance that we shall review our decision via, of course, the appropriate constituent committees. In the meantime, please extend to Dr. Rowland the warmest regards of the trustees, faculty, students, and staff. End of quote. Now you have a better idea of just why I am so anxious about the university's budget problems. <laughs> there are, of course, much better reasons. The university is, in fact, in deep financial trouble. The money tug of war is a fact of life in the state capital and it always has been. But the game has taken a decided turn for the worse. This has several grim implications for the University of California, and I'd like to discuss some of them with you before we get into questions and answers on whatever you may be curious about. I'll do my best to give you straight answers. The overriding fact of the budget proposed by the governor for the University of California for next year is that it is not enough. It just does not provide us with the wherewithal to do the job assigned us. I hope that I am able to convey to you the seriousness of the threat facing the university. 
I know that you may have become somewhat accustomed to administrative cries of anguish each year at this time. But I want to point out to you that each of the last four years has indeed provided its own justification for his stress. Each of them has hurt. Together they seem even worse than the sum of their parts. I want to emphasize, however, that the budget proposed for next year is not just more of the same. It is by far the worst budget yet, and I refer to all its parts, the operating budget, the capital budget, and salaries. The operating budget proposes the same number of dollars for the university next year that it will spend in the current one. But this in no way can be construed as the same amount of money in terms of what it will buy. Inflation is chopping away at the value of money at the rate of nearly 6% per year. And inflation hits the university with no less force than it hits a family. In effect, we are being asked to provide the same quality of instruction, research, and public service to more people with millions of dollars less in purchasing power. Since 1966-67, and including the projected enrollment for next year, the University of California has added many more students than are currently enrolled at Stanford University, a 34% increase. And we will absorb them with only a 6% increase in budget when adjusted for inflation, 34 and 6. I think it is particularly significant to note that per student expenditures will have declined by over 20% in constant dollars over a five-year period. I know that the state is in serious financial difficulty. I know also that it almost always is. But it is my special duty to safeguard the University of California to state its needs plainly and forthrightly, and I intend to do so. Ten years ago, in response to the surge in college enrollments stemming from the post-war population increase, the people of California and the state legislature approved policies and initiated financial support which instructed public higher education in California to undertake the most dramatic expansion the world has ever known. Thus, the university committed itself to add over a 10-year period educational capabilities, the equivalent of those that had previously taken 100 years to build, and to do so with no reduction in quality. At perhaps the most critical stage of accomplishing this enormously complex task, state appropriations to the university began to recede sharply. And as a result, our new campuses are only half developed and are only partially meeting the needs of their students. The Santa Cruz, Irvine, and San Diego campuses in particular but also to some extent Santa Barbara, Riverside, and Davis have had their growth arrested and their program offering stunted. Many students now find that they are unable to finish the work that they planned because the university has not had resources sufficient to provide what was promised at the time they enrolled. The student-faculty ratio continues to widen Four years ago, it was 14.4 students per faculty member. This year, it is 16.5.
Next year, if the governor's budget is adopted, it would be 17.4, a 20% change over the period. Small wonder that students find cause to complain about growing impersonality. The proposed budget would have the state provide no assistance whatever for construction on the university's nine campuses. Beyond that, the state administration proposes to take back nine and a half million approved in prior years by the legislature and the governor for construction, which the university has been prevented from using. Moreover, this proposal would result in the loss of federal construction grants, which have already been approved for the university. Next year's construction budget would be serious enough if it were a one-time occurrence. But in fact, it is the third budget in a row that would provide no state funds for construction of a single major building or even for working drawings for one. As you may know, the university has three new medical schools at Davis, at San Diego, and at Irvine. They were opened with small enrollments and mostly in temporary quarters, and they have stopped there because of lack of funds. Fifty million dollars in federal funds have been lost to the university over the past four years because of the failure of the state to provide California's matching share of the construction and equipment cost of health science facilities. The proposed budget provides no money whatsoever for expansion in medicine and dentistry. As the university is the state's main source of health care professionals, I have an obligation to inform you that the time is nearly here when too few physicians and dentists will be available to deliver even a minimum level of health care services to the people of the state. Our request for medical and dental school construction can be refused only at the risk of inadequate medical and dental services. I don't know how to say it more plainly or strongly. These funds are crucial. And there are none there. One of the university's three main functions is research. I quote from the state's education code. The legislature hereby finds and declares that the University of California is the primary state-supported academic agency for research. Yet the university's research effort has been severely restricted over the past four years. In 1967-68, our organized research area suffered a deep budget cut, and the increases of the last three years together don't even restore half of it. On top of this, the budget for next year proposes, quite aside from the continuing loss from inflation, an overall cut of 8% for research more than three million dollars. California's competitive position with other states and with the nations of the world depends heavily on research conducted in all of the universities, public and private, located in this state. And that is important. But even more important is the general health and well-being of our people. If this budget is approved as proposed, approximately 200 skilled scientists, technical and administrative staff will have to be laid off in organized research. A loss of effort, which in this time of mounting environmental and social problems, we can ill afford to sustain. Vital work in many areas will be retarded or terminated work on environmentally safe insecticides, 
DDT, mercury toxicity in food chains, geothermal energy, air and water pollution, drug abuse, alcoholism, heart and lung disease, seawater conversion, oceanography, to name a few examples. Our future as a state and as individuals is inextricably intertwined with this work, and it just makes no sense to hamper it, to cut into our potential. Last November, I initiated more systematic efforts to improve the quality of undergraduate education in the university. The faculty and administration have been working hard to revitalize undergraduate instruction because we all know that it has suffered relatively during the post-World War II period of rapid growth of graduate education and research. Now at the very time we are moving to afford our students closer contact with faculty in small classes and seminars, the budget not only provides nothing for the 281 new faculty positions we are seeking, but also eliminates a hundred faculty positions which we now have. It is ironic that just at the time that we are especially anxious to improve a situation which nearly everyone agrees should be improved, we are confronted with a budget which in all likelihood will worsen it. You may recall that last year, all state employees received an across the board range adjustment, the so-called cost of living increase. All that is except for the academic employees of the university and the state colleges. I believed then, and I haven't changed my mind, that this was unfair and undeserved treatment of a group of people whose work benefits the whole state. This year, the governor's budget does not even propose a range adjustment, despite the fact that living costs have risen at least 10% since these men and women last received an increase, and despite their being singled out and penalized last year. The average new employee, member of the faculty, joins our faculty as an assistant professor step two at a salary of 10,700. I do not think it is fair to ask him to absorb the high costs of inflation for two years running. The Regents request, budget request of the state is in my opinion a most realistic appraisal of what we need. Made after thoughtful consideration and hard decisions. It is based on the austere standards of this year after four years of trimming. It is in no way a bargaining budget an inflated document full of items to be conceded if and when necessary. It is a hard budget, a realistic presentation of our needs, and I hope it is treated accordingly in Sacramento. Ladies and gentlemen, you can help, for nothing is quite so revered in legislative and executive chambers as public opinion. Please don't make the mistake of underestimating the power inherent in a letter to your assemblyman or state senator. I hope that if you feel so moved, you will write your legislators, talk with them, tell them that you are concerned about what is happening to UCLA and to the university as a whole. I can assure you 
that if enough people involve themselves in preserving and improving the university, they will accomplish wonders. I think we can do it. I'll be pleased to answer your question. Thank you, President Hitch, for a very informative expose of conditions facing the university today. I'd like to have two uh, members of the audience please step on the podium. One of them is our chancellor, Chuck Young, and the other is our president-elect of the Alumni Association, uh, the Honorable Bill Keene. Would you come up and join the two chairs up here so that we can perhaps open this more to the open forum type of discussion? Uh, perhaps President Hitch isn't aware of this, but we're going to hit him on more than the budget. So that uh, this is open sesame on the leader of our university. And if you have any questions, you can hit your chancellor or your president-elect and 2B resident-designate uh, Judge Bill Keene. Hands up for questions. Now, there have got to be some. We've got lots of problems right here. Chancellor Young recently identified <clears throat> the Department of Speech. Excuse me. Uh, one thing we always do, we identify ourselves by name and class. Fine. My name is Stephen Schifrin, and I'm a graduate student in the Department of Speech, and I have a cold, so I <laughs> hope you can hear me. That's accepted. Uh, Chancellor Young recently identified the Department of Speech as a department whose mission, uh, a department which was peripheral to the basic mission of the university. I found this an extremely disturbing statement. It seems to me that communication is vital and that the study of communication is increasingly crucial in the midst of the 1970s. And I was curious what the basic mission of the university would be if it does not involve a department centrally concerned with the study of communication, whether that be intercultural communication, interracial communication, the rhetoric of war and peace, uh, human rights, crime and punishment, et cetera. And just specifically, what is the basic mission of the university if it does not include those kinds of studies? Is that question directed to Chancellor Young or President Hitch? Both would be fine. Uh, Chancellor Young. <laughs> President, President Hitch has deferred to me on that question. Uh, you started in with a statement and then you asked a question, which is not uh, abnormal in these kinds of situations. In the first place, I did not identify the Department of Speech or the Department of Journalism or the Department of Physical Education as being peripheral. I said uh, something like the following. Uh, given the kind of uh, environment in which the university is, finds itself today uh, financially, given the uh, changes that have occurred in enrollment projections, in projections of manpower needs, both within the state and nationally and internationally, and given the fact that UCLA has reached a plateau or is reaching a plateau in terms of absolute growth, we are going to have to regularly, more systematically, more intensively examine all of the things that we are doing. Because if we are going to do new things or if we are going to provide additional support in areas where we feel it is required, it is increasingly clear that that is going to have to come by way of reallocation of resources and not by way of new resources to the total institution. And I, I said that we are no longer going to be in a position where we can afford to do everything that we think is reasonable and needs to be done. We are going to have to establish priorities. I further said that I think there are many programs that we ought to review, some of which uh, ought to be looked at because they parallel work that is being done in the high schools. 
And because we might be able to accomplish the same purpose that we have had in undertaking that work in a different fashion than the way we have now, and that uh, the way we might do it in the future might be more efficient and more effective and educationally more sound. It might cost a little less money, too, which could be freed for other purposes. And I've said that there are some areas, and we, per we indicated that in those particular areas, and now I'm coming to your specific question, uh, there have been many discussions in the past, many questions raised, there's been a kind of continual sniping or guerrilla warfare in regard to journalism and speech and some other programs. And what I have said uh, privately and what I intended to imply and what was stated publicly is that we ought to take a look at those programs and see if there are ways which, in which we can do the job that we say we're trying to do more effectively and more efficiently. One of the things that has been discussed, one of the things that was stated privately, and one of the things that I expect will be analyzed in this process is the possibility of creating a program which focuses on communication, uh, oral and written, and uh, in the electronic area. Uh, this, we're not talking about eliminating something necessarily. We're not talking necessarily about making any change. What we have said is that certain uh, very thorough review and analysis has to be undertaken, and this is an area that we ought to take a very serious look at with the possibility of making any number of changes as that review goes forward. Charlie? I'd like to uh, elaborate just a little on some of the Chancellor's remarks. We are entering a period of much less rapid growth in the university. And this would be true even if there were no financial crisis in the state and in the university. The basic reason is that fewer babies have been born. When we last prepared a growth plan for the university in 1966, we were predicting rapid and steady growth on all the campuses of the university until the year 2000. And it looked to us at that time as if all of them were going to grow to the size of Berkeley and UCLA. And that in addition, we would have to start a couple of new campuses to take care of the students in the 1970s and perhaps another couple before the end of the century. Well, there's been quite a dramatic change in the birth rate, and it's perfectly apparent now that we're going to be growing more slowly in the 70s than we did in the 60s. And it appears that in the 1980s, we aren't going to be growing at all. It appears now as if in the 1980s, there may even be an absolute decline in attendance at the university and in fact, in the numbers in the 18 to 24 year age group in California. Now this means as we top out by about 1980 and with much slower growth rates that we have to take a much harder look at the priorities of what we're doing and what we're not doing. And this necessity, as Chancellor Young has indicated, is accentuated by the budget crisis. But we are, both in the university as a whole and on each campus, taking a very hard look at our priorities. What we don't want to do is to bleed everything a bit. We want to decide what is most important and what is less important, and allocate our resources accordingly. And we are engaged very vigorously in a review of all of our programs with this end in view. Thank you. Next question. Back on the left side. Up, oh, right there. No.
Larry Mann, class of 48 in Berkeley. Uh, would you, President Hitch... That makes you an outsider, but we'll let you go ahead. <laughs> Do I have to carry a flag? <laughs> President Hitch, would you comment on the governor's uh, charges that the uh, professors are not working up to their capacity and that the university is a bureaucratic morass? Well, I... Uh I'm interested in both those subjects. Let me uh, first talk about the professors. The governor in his budget uh, called for a return to what he termed the traditional standard of nine classroom hours per week. Now, I think uh, that that just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. For one thing, I don't think that it is right or reasonable in any way to measure what a faculty member contributes by some simplistic measure of the number of hours that he spends before a class each week. We made a survey two years ago of the way in which the University of California faculty spends its time. We found, and I am just sure that this is right, that the faculty member, on the average, spends each week about 60 hours a week. That is about the same as members of other professions, like law and medicine and so forth, on his job. Now, there can be some differences of opinion about whether the distribution of time among his various duties is just right. And I have some opinions on this, too, and I've stated them in the past, and I will state them tonight. But the number of hours he spends in a classroom, appearing before his students, regurgitating knowledge, is a rather small part of the total. In addition to that time, which amounts to about six hours a week, he spends a lot of time doing some of the following things. Supervising graduate students working on their theses. Supervising independent study by undergraduates, which is something that we have been trying to increase. Preparing for his classes. Reading papers and grading keeping up with his subject, doing research himself, serving on academic senate committees and administrative committees, dealing with such matters as courses of instruction, educational policy, admissions, and all sorts of other things which are necessary to keep the university running. To measure the productivity of a professor by the amount of time he spends before a class would be very much like measuring the productivity of a brain surgeon by the amount of time he spends actually operating. Or consider a National Football League player. How much time does he spend in combat during a 14-game season? Do you know the answer? It's about one and a half hours on the average. A year, one and a half hours. I think this is just an inappropriate measure of productivity. Now, having said that, I don't want to be misunderstood. In the statement that I made on undergraduate teaching 
last November, I made the point that we had been relatively neglecting undergraduate teaching, that I did not think we were doing as good a job on it as we were doing on research and graduate teaching. And I think that some adjustment at the margin between the time the members of the regular faculty spend on undergraduate teaching and on other activities is very desirable, and I want to see it happen. But I want to see it happen in order to improve undergraduate teaching. And it, if you cut the number of faculty, parapassu, as you increase the number of hours they spend teaching in the classroom, you not only are not improving the situation, you are locking yourself in permanently to the present unsatisfactory situation. So I would like to see some change made. I would like to see some increase in teaching hours, not necessarily in the classroom, but in the time devoted to undergraduates. But I want to do that with existing resources, with existing numbers of faculty, going up as the number of students goes up, and if you cut back on that at the same time as you increase the hours, you aren't gaining a thing. You're just locking yourself in. That's my comment on what the governor has to say on teaching hours. Now, I think the balance of this question related to the bloated administrative staff. It just ain't so. The University of California, if anything, is under-administered. The proportion of our budget, which goes for administration, has been falling. And we are just hard-pressed to keep up with the requirements on our staff. We need better information services for management. One of the hardest things is to keep up with the requests coming from the governor's office for information about all sorts of things for which we don't have the people. But I think there is no question that by comparison with private industry, by comparison with the federal government, by comparison with the state government. The university administration is understaffed, not overstaffed. That is my opinion, and I have had some experience in all of these fields. Thank you. Next question. Yes, right here. My name is Om Singla, a graduate student in engineering. President H, uh, my question is regarding non-resident tuition fee increase in the University of California. Uh, in the present increase, it will make almost impossible for foreign students to continue, and the situation is further complicated by the, uh, uh, non -im uh, by the uh, immigration uh, uh, rules and regulations. And I consider this issue a separate issue to uh, uh, university budget cuts. I wonder if something is being done regarding this issue uh, or something could be done. Yes, I'm very sensitive about the problem confronting the foreign students. We are increasing our non-resident, which includes foreign tuition, by $300 for next year. We had to do that for two reasons. One was to balance our budget even at this very unhappy level. 
The other was that the master plan for higher education in California states that the university should impose a tuition on non-residents equal to the cost of instruction. And our calculations indicated that this required with inflation a $300 increase. So next year, non-resident, including foreign students, will have to pay $300 more in tuition and $150 more in the educational fee or a total increase of $450 in one year. Now they have some very special problems in making payments of this kind. That is, those of them who are not supported by their own governments or by our government and who are not wealthy. And there are a good many who do not fall into any of these categories and who have carefully budgeted their educational stay at the University of California. They are not eligible for federal loans. They are not eligible for grants. They do not have work permits, which enable them to work and earn their way. So they have a very special problem. And here suddenly, in the case of many, in the middle of their, of their stay at the university, we have almost without warning very substantially increase the cost of their education. I hope we can do something about it. We're working on it. We're exploring all possibilities. But our general budgetary plight uh, makes it very difficult. And I cannot promise that we can come up with anything that will be satisfactory. But we're going to try. Right here. John, you come to these meetings very regularly. Of the defense of academic freedom. I think that in some institutions there have been abuses of tenure, and I think they should be corrected. I think that there have not been in the University of California. In the University of California, we have the most rigorous review of assistant professors before they are granted tenure. Review by the faculty, by the department at the first, in the first instance, by the so-called budget committee and other committees of the faculty, by the chancellor, and finally by the regents. There is no automatic tenure in the University of California. Tenure is granted only when it is earned and after the most searching review. Tenure does not mean that a faculty member cannot be fired. It simply means that he can only be fired after due process and for cause. And I think that this is the way it should be. It's the way it is. I did not hear this particular broadcast, but I read a lot of the literature on this subject, pro and con. And I think that tenure as it exists in the University of California is not only defensible, but necessary. Thank you, President, President Hitch. Yes?
opinion of President Hitch, the fiscal crisis of the university is a result of just uh, coincidence or circumstance, a result of the uh, overall uh, uh, fiscal state of the state government and of the state of California, and to what extent the fiscal crisis is a matter of deliberate uh, policy. Thank you. President Hitch? Let me say this. I do not think that the governor in his budget has singled out the University of California for especially adverse treatment. I'm talking about the budget proposed for 1971-72. The governor has taken the very strong position that he's not going to increase taxes. Having taken that position, he has just had to bury down very hard on all budgets. So I would say that as far as this particular budget is concerned, that we have not been singled out for special treatment, punitive treatment in any sense, that we are just uh, being treated in the same manner as almost every other activity uh, of the state. Certainly a major part of the problems of public universities, and this applies throughout the country and not just in the University of California, a major part of their plight is a result of the fact that the demands on state government for welfare, Medicaid, all sorts of other things have been growing enormously over the last few years. While the revenue sources of state governments are in California and generally throughout the country quite inelastic. So that State governments, like city governments, are indeed facing a very difficult financial problem. And this is reflected in their support of the university and their support of quite a number of other things in which the public has a great interest. And I think that this fact is being generally recognized. It is, I think, uh, encouraging that there is such wide recognition of it in Washington. And the debate seems to be not over whether something should be done about it, but over just what should be done. Whether we should go the route of revenue sharing, which is what the president has proposed, or whether we should uh, go the route of uh, having the federal government take over responsibility for some major function of the state governments like welfare, which is what Wilbur Mills is proposing. Either of those, I think, would ease the crisis of state government significantly and would, therefore, help the university in its budget crisis. I'm not sure that I've answered your question, but that is a very major part of our problem this year and next. Thank you. Next question. These are all pretty easy questions for the president. Back here. Excuse me, Bill, could we get the mic back there to you, please? My name is Bill Feathers, and I guess I'm classified as a friend of the university. Just a friend? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Hitch, uh, you addressed yourself to the capital improvement program, and I'm just wondering if the university can't do what corporations do and other divisions of the state do, 
and that, uh, that is to go into some, site of a, some type of a uh, leaseback program on your buildings, whereby you can uh, amortize this cost over some 20 years, rather than putting out hard dollars in the early stages. It's so difficult for the state and your system. Well, let me say that uh, a considerable part of our capital outlay program is handled in that sort of manner now. All of our residence halls, all of our parking structures are financed entirely from internal sources. We borrow the money and then we provide service on the net by charging the occupants of the residence halls and the users of the parking facilities. We get no state money whatever for these kinds of facilities. But we can't do the same for academic buildings because they don't produce any revenue. I have proposed to the Board of Regents, and they have actually accepted my proposal last year and for next year, but they seem reluctant to uh, commit themselves beyond that. I have proposed that they commit the income from student fees, which is called the educational fee, the so-called tuition, to support the capital outlay program in the university, the academic building. I think this would have many advantages. You see, in the case of our operating budget, there is a tradition that this is provided by the state from its general fund each year. They don't often provide enough, but they do provide an operating budget from the general fund. In the case of the capital budget, there is no regular source of income. There have been bond issues in the past in some years and not in other years. There has been a program of providing the state Tidelands oil revenues to the support of capital outlay in higher education, but this is an off again, on again thing. And in some years, a few years, there have been contributions from the general fund. But we never know when we prepare a capital outlay budget what the source of funding is going to be. And it almost always turns out to be far less, and this has been true particularly in the last four years, than we think it ought to be and then we plan for. In fact, last year it turned out finally to be minus 2.8 million. They cancel more projects than we got. And for next year, it looks like it may be the same. They're canceling 9.4 million projects, which just plays havoc with our planning of construction and capital outlay on the campuses. I think if we could dedicate the revenue from the educational fee to this purpose, that we could vastly improve and rationalize our capital outlay program. It doesn't give us a lot of money. It gives us about $25 million a year. But I think that if we knew what it was going to be, we could just do a lot better with it. Now, one thing we could not do, and that is also support from this source, the special needs in the health sciences. We cannot build our three new medical schools from the educational fee, as well as taking care of the requirements on our general campuses. And for that reason, I am proposing that we try again next year for a bond issue for facilities for these three medical schools, which we and the state desperately need. And that's going to cost a lot of money but I think 
we can persuade the state that it must be approved and we must try again. We failed last year by 55% to 45%. But I think that the vote last year came up at the worst possible time. It came up at the beginning of June, immediately following the Cambodian Kent State reconstitution crisis. I think that next year we can and must carry it. Next question. Yes. I'm Clark Hunt of the class of 1933. I think President Hitch missed the most important factor in the defeat of the bond issue, and that was the very inept handling by the administration of the recommendation by the philosophy department faculty that Angela Davis be rehired. I've talked to hundreds of members of the alumni and every one of them voted against the bond issue for that one purpose alone. The only way they could express their disapproval of using university funds to hire communist professors. And I think if they're going to have another bond issue, they'd better be careful and not repeat that mistake. I don't know that that given. I, I don't think that's a question, is it, President? <laughs> no. I think that was a statement, and I think probably the statement is quite true. Bill Handy. Thank you. Bill Handy, class of 1948. President Hitch, uh, if we're forced to live with the governor's budget, would it be feasible to accommodate ourselves to the budget by reducing the number of students that are admitted to the university by raising the uh, eligibility requirements rather than by chancing uh, reducing the quality of the education? And then as a corollary to that question, uh, is it a correct assumption that uh, the per student cost at the state college level would be correspondingly less than the per student cost at the university level. Let me take the two questions in turn. I think we could not solve our problems by cutting enrollment. Certainly not at the undergraduate level. It would simply be politically unacceptable. And if we tried to find a way out of our dilemma that way, we would be clobbered. We would not be permitted to keep even our present budget. We have trimmed our sales very much at the graduate level. We have reduced our projected increases at the graduate level. But we are continuing to take, for 1971-72, all of the qualified California resident undergraduates. And I hope that we will be able to do that in future. Now, we can't continue doing this forever. If, for example, we continue to get capital budgets without a single new building for year after year, as we have for the past three years, we just are not going to have the facilities to continue to take the increase in enrollments during the 1970s. But we are going to come up against a very major political crunch when we stop taking qualified, that is in the upper 12 and a half percent, California resident undergraduates. Now let me comment on the second part of the question. Is university education more expensive than state college education? 
If you look at the university budget and divide it by the number of students, you come out with a number that's a little over $3,000 per student. And if you take the state college budget and divide it by the number of full-time equivalent students there, you come out with a number that's more like $2,000 per student. But if you look at the cost of instruction at the same level in the state colleges and the university, you will find that, for example, at the lower division undergraduate level, it is practically identical. At the upper division level, undergraduate, it is practically identical. At the master's degree level, it is practically identical. What is the explanation? Well, there are two explanations. One is that the university budget contains a substantial appropriation of funds which are not closely related to instruction. For example, our organized research funds, our agricultural research funds. The other part of the explanation is that the university has a very different mix of students from the state colleges. We have five medical schools which are tremendously expensive, the most expensive, provide the most expensive kind of education going. The state colleges have none. We have the dental schools, also very expensive. The state colleges have none. We have the doctoral programs, the PhD programs, which we estimate cost three and a half times as much per person enrolled as lower division undergraduates. The state colleges have none. We are more expensive per student in this simplistic way because we have a completely different mix of students. But if you look at undergraduate instruction at the lower division level or in the upper division level or at the master's degree level, our costs are about the same. The average salary of a faculty member in the University of California is less than a thousand dollars more than the average salary of a faculty member in the state colleges. They're essentially the same. The student faculty ratio in the University of California is essentially the same as in the state colleges. In fact, theirs, I think, is now a little better, a little better. Despite this very different mix of students, despite the fact that we have the doctoral students and they don't. So it just can't be that the state colleges are cheaper. They aren't. Uh, next question. Back there. My name is William Eady. I'm class of 1968. And I'd like to ask President Hitch, please, would you predict into the future for us, sir, um, you've been talking about how the university is going to level off by 1980. Uh, you've been talking about how UCLA and Berkeley have, uh, at the present time, peaked and that we need to develop the other campuses in the system. Uh, would you say then, sir, uh, excuse me, would you give us a, an estimate of where our priorities here at UCLA and at Berkeley are going to lie in the next few years? Uh, assuming that we have um, what we're going through now, that, that programs are, which are considered peripheral are being eliminated, uh, what more can we expect? What programs are, are further going to be eliminated? What direction are we taking? Are we going to a, 
a school that is going to be graduate and upper division only, a graduate school only? Are we going to a science dominated school? Are we going to a humanities dominated school? Just what direction are we heading in, please, sir? Quite a question. Well, that's a broad question, and it's one that I feel I would have to answer jointly with the chancellor. It's my responsibility, my primary responsibility, to divide resources among the campuses and also to look at what the various campuses are doing by way of initiatives to make sure that they fit together and make sense from the point of view of the university as a whole. On each campus, the chancellor, with his administrative and faculty and other advisors, is responsible for taking the initiatives with respect to priorities. Let me first rule out, absolutely, I think I can rule out, some of the alternatives which you mentioned. I do not think there is the slightest possibility of the University of California at Los Angeles or the University of California at Berkeley becoming strictly a graduate institution. I do not think there is any possibility of these institutions becoming graduate and upper division only. One of the results of this reduction in growth that we now anticipate is that it just wouldn't make sense to do that. If you made UCLA and Berkeley, for example, purely graduate institutions, the two of them together would accommodate more than all the graduate students that you would need in the whole University of California. And this wouldn't make sense. So I think that can be ruled out altogether. We are going to have to look university-wide at the programs in each professional area, in each disciplinary area, to make sure that we don't have too much duplication of programs in any disciplinary area within the university, and also to make sure that all the bases get covered somewhere. We're going to the greatest extent possible permit each campus to choose its own priorities. That can't be done absolutely because there may be a tendency for all the campuses to choose one discipline and neglect another. And that we cannot permit. But I'm afraid that's about as good as I can do at this stage. I do not expect any drastic change in the character of the University of California at Los Angeles over the next decade. I think that there will be some shifts in priorities. Some things will be dropped at the margin. Some new things will be started. Some departments and programs will get more support and some less. But I do not expect that the University of California at Los Angeles will look substantially different in its composition of undergraduates and graduates and professional schools in 1980 than it looks in 1971. Chuck? I'd, uh, I'd like to follow up on that a bit. Uh just, uh, and again, without going into any details, to sort of sketch out what we see as the changes, both from the current and the changes from our previous plans as we look again at the future. Um, to, uh, to give you uh, 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 some idea of the current situation, uh, uh, to, to take undergraduates and graduates, we currently have about 28,000 students at UCLA. Of that, uh, some 25,000 plus are on what we call the general campus or within the general campus and uh, something just under 3,000 in the health sciences. Um, 
our previous plans had called for uh, uh, an ultimate enrollment limitation of about 27,500 with 25,000 on the campus and 2,500 on the health uh, sciences campus. We are now in the process of revising our plans and we're fairly far along. We haven't had all the reviews and analysis thus far, but uh, uh, my guess is that uh, by 1980, uh, we will have 30,000 students at UCLA, 27,000 on the general campus, and 3,000 in the health sciences. Um, in terms of undergraduate uh, graduates in the general campus, we currently have about uh, 17,000 uh, undergraduate students and about uh, 8,500 graduate students. Our previous plans had called for cutting the number of undergraduates uh, in long-term in long planning down to about 13,000 and increasing the number of graduate students to about 12,000. Uh, my guess is at the moment that uh, we will maintain the undergraduate student body at almost exactly its current level of 17,000 through the next decade. Uh, and that graduate enrollment will increase, but instead of increasing to 12,000, it will increase to 10,000. In terms of the professional uh, versus uh, professional vis-a-vis -vis basic discipline uh, work at the graduate level, I think the percentage of students in the professional schools will increase in relation to what it is at the present time and will increase in relation to our previous plans. More of our students will be in medicine, dentistry, law, business administration, uh, etc., and somewhat less in uh, the basic disciplines in the College of Letters and Science than we had previously thought would be likely. Within the College of Letters and Science, uh, my guess is that the distribution of students will not differ very substantially uh, among uh, various schools and colleges, among broad area discipline, discipline areas, than it does now. So I, that perhaps is a little more detailed picture, but I think tends to substantiate what President Hitch has said. Thank you, Chuck. Let's just have one more question because we try to quit at 9 o'clock on the button. Right over here. No, the young gentleman over here. Sorry. Dr. Charles J. Lang, graduate class of 1960. I've been concerned about two items with this budget. One, uh, last year there was concern about the continued existence of the University Elementary Laboratory uh, School. Since it has become interested in helping to develop programs for the ghetto and minorities, I was interested in what is the possibility of it being affected, and second, what are the possibilities of minority program, minority support being cut? Uh, I went to UCLA with support, GI support, and I think I paid the government back in taxes uh, for that support. I don't think you were alone in that GI support. Charles Hitch? Well, I, th I think there's a pending question. Can we have the pending question first? Let me uh, make a general answer to the second of your questions, sir. Uh, I, I think the first of those questions I'll have to refer to the chancellor because I don't know the details about that. As far as the minority programs are concerned, we have tried for three years to get some support from the state for our educational opportunity programs. We have had no success at all. We have tried again this year the governor has included nothing in his budget. And he has cut the support of these programs in the state colleges and in the community colleges. We have been supporting these programs exclusively from Regents funds, from the university's own resources. And we have been able so far to build them up a bit each year and to keep some progress. I stated last year that I did not see how, unless we got some state support, we could continue the increase. And while I'm going to look very hard, 
that is still my opinion, that there is no source of continuing funds that we have available to us unless we can get some from funds from the state. And I hope we can, but I cannot say that I am too optimistic about it. In regard, in regard to the University Elementary School, uh, the reason this comes up is because there was a proposal last year to cut uh, from the budget uh, the support uh, for the University Elementary School. Um, it came along with a with a uh, proposal that uh, uh, that these that the that this support be cut not only for the university but for the state college uh, uh, demonstration schools, and there were a lot of reasons given for them. After very thorough study, uh, the state uh, uh, department of finance and the legislative analyst office concluded that most of the charges that were leveled against, against the state college demonstration schools were true, uh, and none of them were true about University Elementary School. Indeed, they came out with what I think is a very uh, position, uh, very strong support for University Elementary School, so that the total program is not in any way endangered at the present time. Uh, University Elementary School, along with the rest of the budget, uh, I think is going to, uh, if the current le budget stands, is going to have to be cut somewhat. But it will be a cut in proportion to the cut that all other programs within the university are having to take. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, thank you, President Hitch, for appearing with us this evening. It's indeed been a pleasure to have this very revealing discourse as far as the problems of the university are concerned. If you have any questions and you wish to remain after the meeting has been dismissed, I'm sure that the president will be pleased to answer them. Bill, I appreciate your appearing on the scene, and I know that you may do a fine job when you have an opportunity to take over as a regent for the University of California. We plan to continue this series if we do have uh, the attendance that we have this evening. As you know, we were very disappointed at the number that did appear for the student seminar that we had, but I feel that tonight does indicate that there is an interest in the Alumni Association in continuing this general program of attempting to bring the Alumni Association closer to the various segments in, in our community. I do thank you for attending, and I'm particularly encouraged by the fact that I see so many of you do appear at each one of these occasions. Thank you very much.